today, for those who do not know, and now we have a guest from India joining, uh, this is the Social and Communal Harmony book with two bonus bikinis at the bottom. In fact, they look a bit like us. <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> they really do. <laughs> and uh, today we're on page 119. And um, I was a little bit confused because we had the six principles of cordiality mm -hmm. a couple of weeks back, the 10 principles of cordiality last week. And today it's the ah, seven conditions for social harmony they do say that if there's a number before a particular uh teaching is to be given then people retain it better so hopefully we'll be able to retain it so yeah shall i start mm -hmm. so while i've still got some steam i shall begin mm -hmm. we've lost some people we lost our nun maybe we're too no she probably dropped out maybe um, she hasn't run away. Okay. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Vaisali, at the Sarandada shrine. Then a number of Lichavis approached the Blessed One, paid, paid homage to him and sat down to one side. The Blessed One said this to them, I will teach you, Lichavis, seven principles of non-decline. Listen and attend closely. I will speak. Yes, Bante, those Lichavis replied. And the Blessed One said this. And what, Lichavis, are the seven principles of non-decline? <clears throat> Lichavis, as long as the Vajis, that is the same group of people, that means the Lichavis, uh, assemble often and hold frequent assemblies. Only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. Ah, so we're doing our Friday evening sutta discussions for some time, so hopefully we're growing and not declining in wisdom and harmony. So. As long as the Vajis assemble in harmony, adjourn in harmony, and conduct the affairs of the Vajis in harmony, only growth is to be expected of them, not decline. As long as the Vajis do not decree anything that's not been decreed or abolish anything that's already been decreed, but undertake to follow the ancient Vajji principles as they've been decreed, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. I'll just keep reading because this is fairly straightforward. As long as the Vajis honour, respect, esteem and venerate the Vajji elders and think they should be heeded, only growth is to be expected of them, not decline. So this is about respect, of course, and perhaps understanding too, think they should be heeded. But I'm sure that will bring up some questions and some thoughts. Number five, as long as the Vajis do not abduct women and girls from their families and force them to live with them, only growth is to be expected for them and not decline. As long as the Vajis honour, respect, esteem and venerate their traditional shrines, both those within the city and those outside, and do not neglect the righteous oblations as given and done to them in the past, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. And the last one, number seven, as long as the Vajis provide righteous protection, shelter and guard for Arahants, so that those Arahants who have not yet come may arrive. And those Arahants who've already come may dwell at ease there. Only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. See, that's why we have to make a nice vihara. <laughs> Lichavis, as long as these seven principles of non-decline continue among the Vajis and the Vajis are established in them, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. So this is to the Vajis, who are presumably householders. And it's quite interesting that then follows the seven conditions for monastic harmony, some of which are similar. 
at least the first couple, the first three or four actually. And then the last ones are quite different, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Related. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So since many of you, except for three of us here, are actually lay people, I wonder if you relate to any of this or could kind of draw parallels between this and the way that you practice or that you live lives that seem to actually not only not decline, but perhaps, yeah, increase in goodness and in wholesomeness and provide a vehicle of wisdom for you. It'd be interesting to hear from you. Or also, if there are any of these that are a little bit obscure or strange or stand out in some way, it would be quite interesting to hear from you. Mm. So you can either write in the box if you don't want your voice to be recorded or if you want to um, raise your virtual hand or uh, just stick up your actual hand, because mm. most of you are on video, uh, we can unmute you. Your voice will be on the recording, but, you know, it's nice to have a change of voice and it uh, helps mm. people connect to one another. Uh, here we go. Mm. Who's doing the q &A? Yeah, the co-hosts. Yeah, Someone doing the Q&A? Usually. <laughs> Hiya, can you Hi, hear me? Nikki. Oh, hello, hi, evening. Nice to see um, you. We don't hear you. I don't know if you're speaking already, but we don't hear anything. Oh, Ma can you hear That's me? my computer. Is it I have a feeling can you hear, you can you hear Venerable. Me? It must be your computer. Me? No, it no, is not you, Nikki. Your... I can hear you. Okay, right, right. Right. Oh, can you can you not hear me? You can. <laughs> Shall I go on? Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Oh, I just, um, oh, it's through me. Um, so what am I? <clears throat> so the gist of this, I I'm, if I correct me if I'm wrong, is um. Uh, there's some rules on how to live. I think I just want to ask you a question, actually, about this. Uh, about the um, so, and I think I've mentioned probably to you, so to speak, uh, quite a lot this particular topic, which I guess it also intertwines with everything. So the thing is around loneliness. Yeah. So if I was to think of communities and like that this is that this is a loneliness i've listened to so many buddhist talks on loneliness ajahn brahm does a really good one quite an old one and i it's something i've lived with most of my life and it's sometimes it's very painful and sometimes it feels like it's the kind of average loneliness that you get and then it dips into something and i'm constantly if i was to say what the buddhist path is for me is i'm trying to find answers of why how to i guess i'm still trying to get rid of it right trying to get, <laughs> saying that i'm realizing i'm trying to get rid of it and so i listen to buddhist i listen to talks trying to hear an answer mm -hmm. <laughs> something that might say if you mm -hmm. do this you won't feel this mm -hmm. um and so I suppose I'm constantly looking for reassurance. That's what I think I'm looking for. There's some kind of anxiety around how I live. So when I read, it, you know, when I hear this about people, it's in relationships, aren't they? People are having relationships, basically. Mm -hmm. And it makes me want to run away. I don't want to listen to it because it kind of prods that. Mm -hmm. But I'm also aware of... And now there was a, I don't know who it was, one of the Buddhist nuns said, don't blame the trigger. So mm -hmm. sometimes when I come to this group, for instance, it will make me feel really lonely. It's bizarre. But what I, I thought, don't blame the trigger. And I keep doing that. I think it's not about the people, it's about what's within. But I tend to blame the, the people. So I'll hate everyone. Mm -hmm. I come in and out of that. So I'm just kind of wondering. I don't know. I don't think people are the answer. <laughs> That's right. the thing. I don't think it's about people. I think it's about something else. Right. Have you experienced that sort of loneliness? Yeah, I have experienced that kind of loneliness. I mean, probably not for extended periods, maybe during Corona mostly, like towards the end. 
um, solitude slipped into isolation and it was really strange because it was a kind of loneliness but it was also a kind of um, losing the my how do you call it when the nervous system is regulated losing the regulation actually mm -hmm. like physiologically losing some kind of um, nervous system regulation it was like a trauma I think and I kept having anxiety I mean I think it could have also been conjoined with hormones and changes there yeah. um but and I do agree with you that people aren't necessarily the answer but I think having spiritual friends and spiritual community can be the answer in that it can help you to make peace with your loneliness it can help you to actually be able to go inside with the right attitudes because what we see in spiritual teachers or good friends or people we trust and people who can be role models for us is some kind of very well regulated nervous system but also um, a kind attitude in terms of relating to our emotional world they model that and they help us to see that it's okay to feel what we feel so we can be lonely in their company and we don't have to change the lonely feeling but just the fact that you can be around others when you're lonely already kind of helps you to be with that loneliness if that makes sense it doesn't necessarily remove it but you don't feel alone in it <laughs> you know and the other thing that I've noticed really helps about being around others when I'm experiencing any difficult or any emotion to be honest is that if I can articulate that and share it they feed back to me that they have similar feelings the same feelings and then we can talk about it and I feel oh this is a universal emotion this is a universal feeling this isn't my thing this is just part and parcel of being human and it's just something on the path that is asking me to to look at it and to learn to love it actually to learn to to care for it and sometimes that involves being very tender with it you know so I think that's where the loneliness can start to yeah it hurts and it feels tender and it feels vulnerable but if we can really go into that and be with that with the right attitude, with a kind attitude and a gentle attitude, so that not all at once, uh, then it can start to not necessarily disappear, but you can start to live in its presence. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what I'm doing. I'm, but sure. I'm, I'm frustrated it just hasn't gone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's until you genuinely make peace and when you genuinely make peace it doesn't actually matter because you're not looking for that you're not looking at whether it's gone or not it doesn't matter because all you all you you're just living with a more open heart you see when i hear that i feel peaceful so it's like i almost go for the the talks to and it just like oh need mm -hmm. something need some so that is it it's absolute resonates that's the truth yeah. that's it'll last for the yeah it'll last for 10 minutes and yeah. then uh, <laughs> 10 minutes i only took like two seconds to say it lasts for 10 minutes so that's pretty good you need to record yeah well there is recording so that's why i keep going back to you it's like i won't take up any more time i know I'll, but thank you thank no, you i don't know if you want to say anything more on that or should we go to yeah. this way okay we'll do the next one Susie, can unmute. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so what came to mind um, was the triple uh, refuge. So, you know, like how um, sort of tying into, I think it was um, Nikki's um, response is that um part of a buddhist refuge is like um having refuge in the buddha the dharma and the sangha um so that's like it's like free you can't miss one out and like um the importance of the sangha and like the community aspect because mm -hmm. i i was personally relating to me i was a buddhist like when i was for um 14 15 and I was the only like Buddhist in the whole um of this Catholic high school <laughs> and it was very lonely it was honestly it was like it was so lonely because <laughs> I didn't know any other Buddhists um but 
coming on to this community right now, it feels a lot more calming because mm -hmm. I, I'm in a sense of a presence of like lots of people who understand the same thing as me. Mm -hmm. So I feel very calm by the fact that I know a lot of people who I'm looking at right now mm -hmm. understand and I can practice with them and um, we can grow together as people. Um, I think I was doing a sweater the other day and um, it was about um, a general sense of it was like perseverance and um, kind of um, motivating one another. So like it was this group of lead followers and like, like oh yeah, I'm a bit patient, but I want, um, but I'm not as good as the, the monks and the nuns, but like, I'm going to try and improve myself. Um, I'm, I'm still, I'm equal as normal lay followers. And this person kept on improving themselves and therefore the followers of this lay person kept on improving into the point of that person who kept on improving. So it was like an endless cycle, like we kind of improve one another by improving ourselves kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So the community aspect is really good. If that makes sense. <laughs> we were saying that exact thing at tea time. <laughs> exactly that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. How we kind of like see a quality in one that maybe is weaker in ours mm. and then that improves that quality in ours. They see one in ours that's stronger, improves it in them. It's like working up a ladder. Yeah, yeah it's like up for up with spiral. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess there's not really a question there, but Thank you. Yeah. Shelley? Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, can you hear me okay? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I wasn't going to say anything. There were two of these that really leapt out at me, and I was sure somebody else would comment. <laughs> uh, and it's numbers three and four. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, mm -hmm. and so I suspect that the Buddha was talking about a very specific community here, because yeah. if this is generalities, mm -hmm. um, there are some things in some societies, some traditions, and mm -hmm. some things that the elders approve of that are really wrong. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, such as, you yeah. know, maybe the maybe they've got racist, you know, there's racist yeah. things embedded. Mm -hmm or you know homophobic or things about women or mm -hmm. slavery for example was approved mm -hmm. of um so yeah so i you know they just jumped out at me and i thought mm -hmm. surely these must be specific to this situation maybe the maybe the vajis had wise elders and good traditions and they were going against it but i don't know some some traditions need to be um Yes. uprooted and some elders maybe need to be told they're wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah yeah I also noted that straight away mm. I guess the point is uh, when when you you know make that shift between the hell is this elder uh, saying the right thing and are they not because you know when do you respect somebody when do you uh, go like okay this this is this isn't right so yeah yeah that's the difficulty but um i i always come think of this sutta because we live in com a community anyway in, in uh, monastery in Perth there's like 15 of us so and there's always someone who has <laughs> who has who has everybody has a different opinion and everybody thinks they've got it right but uh, when when do you um yes um uh, push, push your point, point yeah give give up give give way and when do you follow the leader even though you don't necessarily agree so yeah it's a very good question it's a very good question 
But yes. I think you're right in that these people are at least presumably yeah. observing the precepts. Yes. Because the yeah. Buddha would never, you know, recommend that people should heed someone that was actually heedless. Mm. Um, so I think this mm. does kind of infer mm. that they were already pretty virtuous. Yeah. And that's, that's I true. think, when we have to really use our wisdom faculty. Mm. And we don't just follow the leader because they say so, especially mm. if it goes against our inner integrity. You know, even if it's not necessarily breaking the precepts, I think it's so important mm. to be true to ourselves when it comes to real principles and values. Maybe not so much when it's small things like, oh, I don't really want to clean the loo, but the leader said I should, or, you know, mm. or things that would create conflict if you were just mm. putting forward your opinion because it was, I don't know, different and it was going to just create even just more busyness, right? Mm. And it wasn't really important. So mm. I think as monastics, I mean, we're trained to try and let go of the things that are not, you know, pertinent to liberation, basically. We're not going to um, make much difference here or there. And actually what can make the difference is the letting go of mm -hmm. one's views and, and perspectives a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Shall it's we... true, it's true that the virtue of the, per, the the people involved makes all the difference yeah. that this uh, these these principle can, can, principles can be followed when... The members of the community are of high standing and uh yeah that's that's a point yeah yeah just coming to the box does this also include to look after and care for the i think you mean the elders right such as giving chairs to the elders when they get on the bus or train so you can include anything you think it could include if that feels good to you and that brings about the qualities of respect uh orders no <laughs> elders <laughs> um if that brings about feelings of happiness and gladness mm. and respect mm. and then wonderful yeah yeah mm. so it can mm. be many many things mm. respect can take many forms mm. sometimes it's an attitude that we have as well I mean here it's actually yeah as long as they respect esteem and venerate I mean sometimes doesn't necessarily look a certain way. It doesn't mean you bow your head and you hold your hands at your chest necessarily. You can do that thinking, ah, why do I have to do this? It's personal, you know, or you can not have that kind of formality, but really hold somebody in very high respect. One of the things that I think is often misunderstood in some traditions, which are more conservative, is that some people think if you ask questions, that shows disrespect. Whereas to me, it shows the highest respect because I would only ask questions to people I respect. And I respect the Dhamma so much that I want to inquire. So it's not so much how it looks, it's more where you're coming from, I would say. So shall we go to the next people? I don't know if there's a quicker way to do this. More yeah. Pond? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh... To the point that Sharon was making, I think it's a very specific context, Sharon. The... I don't hear you well at all, Mukund. Is there anything you can oh, you do can't. closer? Or... Yeah. Is this any better now? No. A little bit better, not much. Try again. Okay. Uh, let me let me just come back in a bit. Yeah, I'll just try and change okay. my audio. That feels better, actually. Oh, okay. Um, now, I was just saying that uh, to, uh, to Shirley's point about, you know, respect elders, etc. I think there's a very specific context here. The, the, uh, uh, the, the, the virgins were actually a, a, a confederation, right? So it was, it was a bit more democratic. They had multiple states. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a context of retaining that social harmony because they had this whole political thing going mm -hmm. on with uh, Bimbisara. I mean, the, the kingdom to the south of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Post the Buddha became a huge empire, but even at this point of time, there were there was constant political intrigue. So I think it had something to do with social harmony, harmony so that you stay uh, uh, in the political structures intact. So I wonder if that had uh, some of the aspects of you know respect for elders and respect for order uh, versus blind respect. Mm. Yeah, great, good point. Context is so important mm. when reading these things. Mm. Right? Mm. We always have to use our wisdom and discern mm. how it would apply to us. Mm. Can I unmute Sean, please? Hello. Hi. Welcome back. Yeah. Thank you again for having me. <laughs> um, yes. No, just a couple of things 
Oh, and also I sort of break the mold of being last or first. <laughs> um, so when we were talking about how when you're in good company, it kind of raises what you're thinking, mm -hmm. something I often have talked about with my brother who I work with is two or however many minds is more than the sum of. Yeah. So and recently we've had a couple of sort of business meetings and our, each of us will say something and we end up at this amazing place where we would never have got there either of us mm -hmm. all right um so that was just something that came up that I thought and um and then this all kind of then links in when you're part I guess of a, a good community and I would presume not knowing anything about these uh, was it vid vidas um the they're specifically named, so it doesn't say any community, that they were one. Yeah. And then that kind of leads on to me thinking about the precepts. I think you mentioned them. And actually something that happened to me today, I was I was having a moment where I was really hungry and I felt lightheaded. I hadn't eaten enough. And I was in a long queue and it was all a mess and I waited for ages. I had to start eating. And I got to the point where I got fed up and I said, do you know what? I'm going to walk away. I'm not going to pay. It's, you know, I'm fed up. And then I stopped myself and I said, but don't take what is not given. And so I went back, even though I felt awful, I felt like I was going to almost nearly collapse. I thought I can't do that because it, it's not part of who I sort of say I am. And I don't, I've got to hold myself to those things where I can. So I guess that all sort of loops back together. If you're in the company of good people, and if the people like all of these people here knew that I'd done something like that, I would feel, you know, not feel good about it or anyone. Um, and then having good principles, which would be the precepts. So, yeah, just. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> people, are, people are like cheering you on there. <laughs> <laughs> They're not doing the wrong thing. <laughs> because it's also part of community like you reflected on us and and now we can see back to you that yeah indeed it was a good thing mm. and that you sacrificed some of your comfort even at your own physical expense mm. uh for the sake because you know that less happiness can come about through the body than it can through the mind and through the purity of the heart mm. right so you put that above the comfort yeah. of the body which is the way of practice isn't it you know we're coming out of seeking pleasure and avoiding pain in the body and, and looking at how to mm. find that happiness through refining the mind and the, refining the virtue. So very good. And now you've got something to reflect on that can make you happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, someone just put in the box, why does it say provide shelter for Adahats but not other Sangha members? So I think, yeah, it's just that that's the best. It's not that you wouldn't provide it for others, but if you can provide it for our hearts, that's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> and, and actually, in the monastic version, it says, um, so well-behaved fellow monks who have not yet come here, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah. It's, I guess it's for the principle of harmony again, isn't it? Because an arahat will have no contention with anyone with the world, but it's also incredibly good karma if they pick your place. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty cool. I suppose in those days there were quite a few. But uh maybe there are even some among them. Who knows? Yeah. So shall we go to the next one? Uh look, people are like really turning on Sean. That's really great. Yay, Sean's looking happy. And you recovered physically, right? So it's much easier to recover physically than uh, <laughs> the other stuff, which you then regret. And, ooh, yeah, super. All right, well, shall we read the next part? Do you want to read this part? Okay. <clears throat> so, seven conditions for monastic harmony. The blessed one said to the Monastics. <laughs> Monastics, I will teach you seven principles of non decline. Listen and attend closely. I will speak. Yes, Bhante. Those monastics 
replied. The Blessed One said this. And what month are the seven principles? Sorry. I'm when trying I, to train her uh, to gender language. Well, I, I, <laughs> are the seven principles of non-decline. As long, so the first one, as long as the monastics assemble often and hold frequent assemblies, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. Two, as long as the monastics assemble in harmony, adjourn in harmony, and conduct the affairs of the Sangha in harmony, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. As long as the monastics do not decree anything that has not been decreed or abolish anything that has already been abolished or decreed, but undertake and follow the training rules as they have been decreed, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. As long as the monastics honor, respect, esteem, and venerate those monastics who are elders of long standing, long gone forth, fathers and or mothers, or guides of the Sangha, and think they should be heeded, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. As long as the monastics do not come under the control of a risen craving that leads to renewed existence, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. As long as the monks are, the monastics are intent on forest lodgings, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. As long as the monastics each individually establish mindfulness so that well-behaved fellow monastics who have not yet come may arrive and so, and so well-behaved fellow monastics who have already come may dwell at ease there, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. Monastics, as long as these seven principles of non decline continue among the monastics and the monastics are seen established in them, only growth is to be expected for them, not decline. Mm. Mm. So, I just wanted to say if people didn't know that the Buddha's. Um, the way the Sangha is, um, is uh, um, structured. structured is you know, in it, it's democratic and democracy was not the common uh, uh, law in India at the time, but the Lichavis were a democratic order and the Buddha actually followed the Lichavis in um, how he established the Sangha. So, uh, so this idea of democracy is not actually, it, it, it was quite revolutionary in India at that time. And the Lichavis were the ones that, uh, they were apparently quite, a, quite an intelligent and exceptional group of people. They were no, no sort of Joe Blows. <laughs> yeah. So does uh, anyone have any um any thoughts is that the thing you can, can consider yeah susie so um what i took from that is the growth the population would you say the like the population growth of 
um, the Sangha is linked to how many monasteries are built or how many lodgings are built. And that ties into sort of like the great aspect of generosity, like the lay people are so fundamental um, to the well-being of the, the Sangha. Mm. Um, would you say that as part of like how it could be analyzed? I think there are many, well, many conditions that come to come together before the Sangha can grow. Um, and, and without uh, the, the support of lay people, for sure, the Sangha cannot survive. So that is, is, is that's your question. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, this is about harmony. And I've noticed that um, living in community, when there is no harmony and there is no coming together and living in harmony, However well supported you are, however, you know, amazing buildings and food you get, there is just no, when there is no harmony, people just don't stay. They, they, the community just doesn't grow. And I, I've seen that in um, just, yeah, harmony is so important for, for someone to feel at feel that they can uh, stay there and um, and grow mm. so it's not to be underestimated of course you need support definitely but this this harmony is um, maybe that's why there are so many suttas about it as well <laughs> but to yeah. answer the question of what do you call it velocity is that right I don't know sorry you used a word that sort of suggested you're asking something slightly different as well, that like if there were more places, would the Sangha grow? Because there would yeah. be places. And that's, again, I was just smiling because it's a topic we, again, talked about at tea time. So it's as if you were with us. Wow. <laughs> Tuning in because um, basically, I mean, the people who are here now, every single one of the four people mm. have some kind of like inquiry in their mind about ordination, like, mm, no, could it be possible? And honestly, this hasn't, I haven't seen this before while I was still trying to set this up, you know, before we actually had a place, hardly anybody came into the community, whether at the talks or in the old rented place, who ever expressed even an interest, even a thought about it. It was just people who wanted to kind of get to know me or, you know, they thought it was good because of gender equity or Ajahn Bram comes over, whatever, but nobody expressed that. And we were saying it's strange, isn't it? Isn't it the case that unless you actually have an opportunity, people won't know that whether it's something they want or not, because it's not even a question mark in their mind, you know? So it's all very well with harmony, but first you have to have a place. <laughs> so it has to start off with having facilities and I'm sure it takes some kind of harmony even among the community to create a place. But without one, then, uh, you know, you can't do it, not in the Western countries where it's cold. Um, in ancient India, of course, it was different. You could just literally go forth into the forest and with a stick and with your robes and pick up robes on the street or on the funeral pyre. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, in the Western country, which is expensive and where things are hard to come by, you actually need support structures. And I do think the more there are, the more there'll be. Um, you know, people wouldn't even think about it if they didn't hear about it in the first place. Yeah, just like we wouldn't follow the Dhamma if we never heard the Dhamma. It'd be impossible. You have to hear about the opportunity. And it's I do wonder if there's something like uh, you know, like in quantum physics, they say, uh, or even not in quantum physics, just in, in any area of research, they say that people who get like innovations or certain ideas, mm. when it when it happens on one side of the world, it starts to happen on the other as well. Mm. And I just wonder if it's something like that, you know, that you're putting some sort of mm. something out there so to speak, mm -hmm. and people get a wind of it. Um, and it kind of increases. Mm -hmm. It just increases. It brings mm -hmm. the idea to more people. Mm -hmm. I think that that can be the case. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you don't practice in a way that's inspiring. Thank you. Yes, I do agree with the harmony aspect. I mean, it's 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 what we were reading about. We we're reading about, isn't that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot about the morality aspect to things like you can't be you can't have a stable group if um, you're not moral. 
Yeah, thank you. You can't have a, what did you say, Chloe? Maybe you forget. Stable, stable, stable group. A stable like, group. A stable group. Because if everyone's stealing off each other or like lying or like yeah. um, talking around the backs, it's sort of like, oh no, uh, yeah. it's not going to last long. Right. And even if it lasts, because you will have communities where there's a lot of bad conduct and it might last in terms of people stay, but because they're flocking together with other like minded bad people <laughs> or unvirtuous people, but it won't grow. I mean, the word grow also means spiritually grow. Yeah. So, yeah. So someone's asking, what's the age limit to ordain? So a nice controversial question. Uh, <laughs> well, basically, it kind of depends on the on the monastery, on the conditions, on the, you know, how much work is involved in a place that's very new. We need people with a lot of energy in them and a long way to kind of be able to contribute and because we don't have loads of support coming in. So it's like in any kind of workplace, you can't only hire people that are kind of, you know, older because you want the workforce to kind of build up. So because in the West, it's not just renouncing into structures that are established, it's actually, it's not that. Um, it's actually having to set them up from scratch. It's more like a vocation. It's like a vocational training. So it takes 10 years to train. So, so bearing that in mind, you know, that it takes you up to 10 years before you can be contributing in terms of teaching, in terms of output, in a sense then uh, the younger the better, the sooner the better, not necessarily uh, always the case, but you know, if you do have a strong aspiration and you're mature to go forth, it's good to, to do it while you can. But I would say uh, I wouldn't rule people out, you know, depending on the situation. From my own perspective, I'd want to be as inclusive as possible. So if I had like a few people who were younger and who I knew would be able to take these things forward, then you could carry like a a person or a couple of people who are older it depends a bit on the size as well but usually in most monasteries it's 50 so and in Amravati it's 45 for men which is really young you know really young yeah do you want to ask that one for the seventh point does it indicate that when oneself develops mindfulness it will attract other practitioners with solid practice to come along to practice yay <laughs> yeah I wouldn't yeah. want to go somewhere if I was trying to establish my mindfulness I wouldn't want to go somewhere where no one's mindful so I reckon, yeah I reckon well yes I guess in the uh, I guess the point is that one has to can't you know you have to work on yourself and as you work on yourself then good things come your mm. way uh, rather yeah. than going Oh well, I can't be bothered. Let some, you know, let me bump into good things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sean has and his. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, what your yeah. point is to do it out of compassion? You know, like yes, you do it for yourself. You do it individually, but so that others may come. So you're practicing mindfulness out of compassion, right? And that's really important throughout the practice that we're not just in it for ourselves and our own freedom from suffering, but we're practicing mm. for the good and benefit of ourselves and others. The Buddha said that's the best. He did say it's better to practice for yourself than only to practice for others, but to practice for both is the best. So, can I come to another question in the box first? Because I do want to get people in who haven't spoken yet. So for the monastics, there's a stronger emphasis in developing mindfulness and being content with less, i.e. staying in forest lodgings. For lay people, maintaining traditions is noted in point six. Yes, I think lay people have more of a tendency to follow rituals or more traditional practices when we should focus more on meditation. <laughs> right. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, mm. that's interesting. I mean, here the Buddha's kind of pointing that out as a principle for the Vajians. So again, you know, it could be something specific to them, but I think it also just points to being respectful of um, your teachers, really, even if, uh, you know, perhaps you are now a Buddhist or whatever, just, I mean, one of the advices that most teachers would give to their students is to still um, take care of anyone who's helped you on the path, right, which includes your parents, for example. So I kind of think it might be coming from there, um, but it wouldn't disclude, you know, you could have both, right? You could do that and you could 
practice mindfulness but yeah absolutely I mean uh many Sri Lankan people including I think you were saying something similar to this but many of our Sri Lankan supporters say that you know when they were in Sri Lanka they kind of saw Buddhism as a lot of ritual and um you know they understood the kind of principles but it didn't really come alive for them um Minori's nodding um because it it seemed more like a, a religion than anything else and it took some sort of inner motivation usually spurned by suffering spurred on by suffering uh to really try and understand what dhamma is as in how do we free ourselves from suffering and follow the path of peace so yeah meditation helps with that but i don't think it's a should either i think sometimes we have to be ripe you know because if we meditate because we think we should it also becomes a ritual doesn't it you know we have to be motivated from wisdom from a genuine wish to understand and to uh, hopefully end suffering at least a little bit. Yeah. I don't know if that really answers, but you're welcome to write anything else there. Uh, yeah, shall we come to Sean again? Hi, yeah. I just thought it was really interesting that um, the monastics that talks about craving, which I would have thought would be so important for lay people. I know for me it is. And I even noticed in my meditations, I have, I, I listened to talk from Ajahn Brahm actually, and it's made me much more aware of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing was about forest lodging. So I never realized and I never really thought or had more thought into it, but is, is this where the Theravada Buddhism forest thing comes from? It was something that the Buddha pointed out as very important specifically. Mm -hmm. For, for monastics yeah. so two questions different, very different ones and Sorry. ones so uh just so i remember them really um in the case of the first one i think it's important not to see these lists as like absolutely set in stone and exhaustive it's more like he chose seven to to relay at that time it doesn't mean that uh you know the lichavis the vagians it's the, they're the same people um shouldn't work on undermining craving you know not coming under the the um, spell of craving it just means that they're not the ones he's pointing out here he's pointing at these seven particularly um presumably as a response to a particular condition at the time particular circumstances at the time but i think the other reason is because here it's not just saying not come under control of craving he's saying that leads to renewed existence so that's almost pointing to ending, you know, becoming fully liberated, right? So that's a high bar, and maybe that's more realistic addressed to monastics because there is some um, some sort of evidence or in the text that, yeah, it's very difficult to become fully enlightened as a lay person. So I think that might be why it's addressed here. That's the that's the ult that's the goal for which one goes for. It's not that lay people wouldn't have that goal or couldn't develop that goal, but that is our duty in a sense, right? We go forth, when we ask for the ordination, we say, um, um, Nibbana Sachiko Entire, uh, how is it like? Sabbadukka Nisaranam, Nibbana Sachikari Entire, which means like, please give me the going forth for the sake of the end of all suffering. So, you know, you're having that as your kind of very clear goal and uh, I mean, it's wonderful if lay people have that as a clear goal too, but you may then find that at some point you lose your hair. <laughs> yeah. So, and the other one, do you want to say something about the forest, Williams? Uh, that, that's that important point in the Theravada tradition of probably, mm. I don't know, possibly all traditions, but yeah, um, it's that idea of solitude and being away from the city, from the, I'm sure you know this as well, but uh, when you are in the midst of, of, of uh, the activities of the city, you somehow get drawn into it and people come to visit you, they start, you know, uh, asking you questions, how do I do with my difficult husband, whatever it is. So, but um, <laughs> but uh, the I mean, over, I guess in, in the in the uh, this Theravada script, anyway, in, in the early Buddhist scriptures, there's 
um, going to going away into the forest as um, important part of monastic life, away mm. from the uh, away from the bustle of the world. Mm. Mm. So it is it is definitely there, definitely there. <laughs> yeah. If that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's why we're putting lots of plants in the vihara, <laughs> so you feel like you've gone to the forest. <laughs> but that's actually why, because sometimes people say, "Oh, it's one o'clock now." Ven chanda needs the rest. Well, it's not ven chanda needs the rest. We're trying to. <laughs> I do need a rest. It's true, but it's actually that we have to have some sort of. Um, if you don't have a boundary, people will talk all day including the monastic, you know, that's just the human mind. So you really have to keep trying to curb it in, curb it in, curb it in, protect the silence, protect the solitude all the time. It's like, it takes a lot of energy from my perspective. It takes a lot of energy. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we'll eat it up. So I guess that's what city life can do. And in the bush, there's much less disturbance mm -hmm. from the outside, but also the Buddha didn't send people straight there. You know, there's a gradual training and first one should have very strong sila, strong virtue, strong sense restraint and have at least quite a lot of happiness coming up from inside through those practices first. And then only he actually says where most people hear about the Satipatthana Sutta going to the root of a tree or whatever. This is after all that preliminary work. Otherwise, you're just going mad. You're just despair of your own mind. You know. <laughs> There won't be enough joy. There won't be enough to draw on to give you any the meditation uh, fuel. Uh, you need some good karma behind you first. Yeah. yeah. So balance. So we've got another few minutes. It'd be nice to hear from others anything about their lives or uh, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Anything about how you might apply these things? Otherwise, I shall ask you something. Uh, okay, Leon has something. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking that um, the case between monastics and lay people is a little is a little different because in a monastic community, everyone has come together intentionally yeah. to agree to live by these rules. And everyone has a vested interest in maintaining them. And if you don't, you disrobe. But um, for those of us that are still lay people and householders, it can feel a bit, I guess, like um, the, the thing I keep thinking of over and over again in so many different forms is that like, it seems like the Dhamma is kind of pulling me in one direction and the world is pulling me in another. Yeah, right? absolutely. So the, the Dhamma is, you know, telling me to, you know, uh, 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 abandon sense cravings and, you know, make, maintain a level of modesty and a level of detachment and solitude. And it seems like everything in the world is uh, designed for like the opposite of that. <laughs> so I, I, I don't, I don't have anything like particularly, but it's just something I think about a lot that it's, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, because I guess I, I typically I'm, I'm from more of a Mahayana background. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the points there is that there's no ultimate distinction between the world and the Dharma. But uh, it often feels like, you know, um, it, it often feels like there is this pull or this tension. Um, and I guess it's just something everyone has to navigate in different forms. And I guess even being a monastic, maybe you don't escape. It's not like perfectly easy <laughs> to live in a monastic community. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. And that was my first thought when you started talking that, you know, in monastic life, you're still in the world, right? You're not like on another loka or something. You're still in the world. So in my case, I had to make my own monastery literally because I had nowhere to go. So I had to start my own monastery from scratch, you know, with nothing. That's a really a lot of stuff and you're working in the world. So, yeah. But the thing is, yeah, your aims and intentions are different um and that's what makes the difference you can be busy with the same things I mean if anyone would see me in my day-to-day -day life I'm doing compute I'm doing emails I'm booking tickets I'm doing all sorts of stuff um but it's all for one purpose which is to try to uh 
share the Dhamma and then practice the Dhamma, build up the conditions to practice the Dhamma as well. Um, and yes, you're always going against the stream of the world. I mean, I've got an interesting book that James sent me. It's a collected book of essays from Bhikkhu Bodhi, and he says that it, there's a very, very clear distinction in Theravada and from the Buddha's words in the uh, early Buddhist text that samsara and nibbana are absolutely completely polar opposite. I mean, it doesn't mean you don't apply dhamma in your day-to-day -day life, but they're going completely in the opposite direction. Samsara is about craving. Samsara is about renewed existence and, you know, uh, suffering life after life. And nibbana is the end of all that. It's going completely against the stream. So there is a difference there. And I think, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I guess this is one of the reasons people go forth because they want to kind of get into a stronger current in other words, the Sangha that's going against the stream as well, because that helps them. But I think, you know, considering the strength of the way the world pulls you, you have to really chalk it up if you can actually go against that even a little bit. You know, every time you say no to something, every time you choose to sit instead of to, I don't know, go out with your friends. I mean, it's okay to go out with your friends, but, you know, every time you make a choice for the Dhamma is like very powerful because you're cutting through some really strong conditioning. So yeah, it is possible. It is possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if I can share a story that someone here told me the other day about bees, because it was really inspiring. I told my dad about it today because he um, tends to kind of bring up all his faults and things that are worrying or, you know, going wrong in his mind. And I was talking about the power of, the opposite going against that kind of conditioning and looking for the good and here somebody was saying yesterday that uh, they were stung by a whole swarm of bees when they were quite young and these bee thingies were all over their head like embedded and their mom had to pull them out one by one and they were deeply traumatized as you can imagine and for years and years couldn't go near bees you know whenever they saw a bee it was like terror it was like trauma and wanting to run away and then one day when they were like in their thirties, um, they just decided, right, I'm going to overcome this and reverse that conditioning, uh, break that cycle of reactivity. And even without a lot of experience in meditation, they understood that they needed to actually go near to that thing that was scaring them. And I'm not saying we should all do this, especially not with bees or, you know, things that sting, but, um, they had the presence of mind to do this and to gently, gently, gently um, go up to a, a, a swarm of bees <clears throat> with a really kind attitude, reassuring the bees they had nothing to fear, they were not there to harm them, and going very gently and stopping when their heartbeat started to come up, stopping, breathing. And they managed to do it without getting stung. And since then, it lifted, you know? And I was saying that to my parents today to just point out the power of like when you can go against the stream or against conditioning against that kind of negativity tendency or whatever it is when you're strong enough right um and that it can just so quickly cut through years of more negative conditioning or conditioning that leads to suffering so i really think every moment that we're aligning our lives to the Dhamma is incredibly powerful because you wouldn't have done that without hearing the teachings, you know, you wouldn't have done that. So yeah, there is something inside the human mind. I mean, not to be totally negative, there's something inside us that has an instinctive kind of taste for peace and an instinctive search for like genuine happiness. And also that's deeply humanely kind, you know. I really, I really believe that's our strongest tendency. Should we come to Mukund? Last, last point, maybe, for the evening. Well, uh, <clears throat> I hope I'm audible. Uh, Venerable, that is a very interesting you know, story you just shared. And it just triggered a thought. I mean, obviously, both of you have worked a lot on your own mind and, you know, defilements and challenges and stuff. Uh, and we always talk about, you know, look at it and kind of like, you know, to overcome it. But... Could you ever share anything about it becoming a bit too much sometimes? You try to address something and like, oh my God, now I'm really yeah, stuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, I think in this example, the person was ready to do it, you know, <laughs> and uh, they felt strong enough and they did it extremely gently and carefully and, and with a lot of kindness. And I think that's what we need. That's why the three right intentions are so key to the practice. Um, you know, the Buddha is saying suffering needs to be met, I think, in order to be understood, right? We have to actually experience it and we will experience it, but we have to like go close to it and understand it. But he's giving us the three right intentions as something to carry with us when we approach the suffering. So they are the intentions of loving kindness, of letting go, not controlling the experience, not kind of um, identifying with it, right? Letting it be. And also um, the compassion, the non-cruelty, or if you like, the gentleness. And I think we have to be incredibly gentle with our minds, you know, and very respectful of our capacity to, to turn toward things that are difficult especially things like traumas um, and really cultivate a lot of these wholesome qualities first of all um, and then yeah approach them not in a way to kind of break through and bust through and kind of eradicate all trauma and this isn't what the person had in mind it was just like let me see if I can turn it around it wasn't like let me just break through that just came as a result I think of right attitude so we can't you know we can't um force the effects the the results but we can just like use the right attitudes in addressing any situations in our life and trust that those results will come in their own time so yeah I think it's very personal very individual and we really probably a, a rule of thumb is to be more kind and more gentle than we think we should I don't know what do you think Oh yeah, that's an example, but in yeah. response to face and suffering. Uh, yeah, no, it's true. We tend to go at it with like no pain, no gain kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, is contrary to the Dhamma. Yeah. We usually yeah. do lots of pain, not much get like lots of what do you call yeah. something that runs with pain that's regression anyway? <laughs> oh. Lots of pain, more pain. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. All right. I think that ends the day. So I hope that this has been uh, interesting, inspiring, helpful, supportive, encouraging, whatever. In whatever way that is for you. And you may find. Oh, oh, now we have a. Uh, Venerable Sumedha would like to speak. Yes, I think you're on mute. Hello. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? We can. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, that was just a general thought that if one abides in loving kindness most of the day, um, I think that creates a kind of a uh, pleasant environment for oneself and others. And that will probably address most of the points um, in uh, about harmony, about getting along with others. And like most of the seven points will be mm. kind of blanketed by this attitude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, so. I think so. Yeah. Even if you dwell in forests with loving kindness in your heart. Um, it's amazing what things can happen to you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Why they call it one of the protections, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the Buddha talks about um, you are going to be loved by human beings and mm -hmm. non human beings. Um, fear is not going to hurt you, like, not going to affect you. So sometimes when we are having anxiety or panic attacks, just um, uh, try to remember this uh, feeling of metta, especially for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of like gives you a protection as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Just yeah. remembering the Dhamma is always good. Mm -hmm. It's always a protection in times of fear, anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Sad, sad, sad. sad. <laughs> 
That's a lovely note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> and metta for everyone here. <laughs> and to you, Bernie Paul, as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Lovely to meet you. And yeah, Lovely to meet you, too. <laughs> you shared that beautiful reflection to end, which I would completely wholeheartedly support. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Great. All right. So, uh, oh, yes. Monori? Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were, <laughs> I, I, I thought you were going to tell something else. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. I was quiet. <laughs> so, uh, today's Sutta discussion, as you know, is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. And any contribution you are able to make is very gratefully received and will help support Venerable Chandas and all the other Venerables and um, uh, any aspiring nuns, guests uh, <laughs> who are coming there to learn. And uh, uh, it's, it's really encouraging to see all those people there. And also the day-to-day -day running of the Vihara in Oxford and, um, and uh, development of the England's first monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. And um, uh, also, if you are capable to do more than a donation or if you want to do something else other than a monetary donation, you can provide food dana for the venerables um, by visiting the Vihara if you are close by or you can remotely organize that. And uh, also there are different ways of getting involved. You can volunteer, you can, uh, there, are, there are a couple of WhatsApp groups um, where then uh, to provide food when there's no, no food available or to do any one-off work. If you are, you know, happen to, happen to go to Oxford or you, you can go to Oxford um, and to do something, or a weekly supermarket delivery. So if you are interested in, in anything like that, um, please uh, send an email to team at anukampaproject.org. If you want to, um, if you want to kind of stay there and see how the life of a monastic is, or you know, if you are considering how, what, and uh, yes, you can, also write a team and see, um, get that experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, yes. Yes, and um, just one last note about our upcoming events. Uh, what do we have? Well, we haven't done it yet in the newsletter, but on the 17th of June, before Venerable Upeka leaves, uh, we're doing a day retreat together in Cambridge and you're all invited and although I know a lot of you can't possibly make it all the way from India or <laughs> wherever you are for one day but uh, all the same you're invited uh, <laughs> and Venerable Pekka has kindly chosen a theme that resonates very much for her so it's going to be lovely and healing I think as well. Uh, that's on the 17th of June. So just because we do have uh, lots of stuff to do before then, we might not be able to give as much notice as we'd like. There'll be a place for you. So write it in your diary if you'd like to come. And uh, anything else? So tomorrow there's no meta session. The next one is on the 22nd because we're also having a little break. Uh, and then I'll be teaching in Norway on a retreat. I think it's probably full. I'm not sure um uh from the 22nd to the 29th of this month and uh during that time you have venerable upeka all to yourselves on a friday which is going to be very lovely and uh she had enough of me really over the years <laughs> so you have I, I shouldn't put that sentence in okay anyway you just have venerable upeka all to yourselves which is wonderful and uh, <laughs> and uh what else well Ajahn Bumali is coming isn't he to England and if you are wishing to come to the talks please book because we're a bit worried that they're quite empty <laughs> uh so yes we're coming a long way for this and it's going to be really special and if you don't know Ajahn Bumali or you've heard him on YouTube don't go by that he's really great in person because sometimes it can seem a little bit, oh, it's very intellectual or something. But actually, his joy and his love for the Dhamma is totally contagious in person. It's really great to be around him. So 
Yeah, uh, I don't think June the 17th will be online because it involves me organising a big team of people to put it online. Uh, but it will be recorded at the least, I hope, because we'll have Matthias with us. So uh, at least it will be recorded for later. Yeah, but to do it online would require like a whole booking system separate to that. And uh, yeah, and uh, a whole Zoom co-host team. So I'm actually organizing all these retreats so far and it's just something I can't keep doing. So we need a team and we're collecting people. So yeah, we're collecting people to do this going forward. Mm. All right. I think that's everything. I've probably forgotten something, but uh, yeah, you can go to our website for events. Wonderful. Mm. We'll see you soon. Mm. We can unmute you and you can wave goodbye or say goodbye if you wish. And anyone who's here with us can come and poke their face in the screen if they wish. Would you like to? It's really cute when people do. It's really cute. Come, come. First they said no, now they're doing it. Yay. So you get to see our lovely guest. You have to come really in. Yeah. Yay. Oh, this is so cute. Come, come. Oh, see, we're a proper community now. Yay. Um, <laughs> Is that there? That's Joanna, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>